from the last part of Zephaniah chapter 3, the verses 14 to the end. So let's read that again. Zephaniah 3, starting at verse 14. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord, your God, is in your midst. A mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors and I will save the lame and gather the outcast and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in at that time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters, can you rejoice when times are tough? Is there joy in your heart even while you grieve? Paul exhorts the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. In 1 Thessalonians, we read the command to rejoice always and to give thanks in all circumstances. But is it possible to rejoice when our world seems to be falling apart? What about our brothers and sisters who are continually oppressed and even imprisoned for their faith in countries like China? Our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan now, so much uncertainty. How can they rejoice in their misery? How could Paul give these commands to rejoice when he so often endured misery. It is easy to rejoice when all is going well, when God seems to be blessing us from every side. But how can we rejoice when the Lord seems to be putting us through hard times, when the burdens of life seem to crush us, when it seems that things will only get worse, The faithful at the time of Zephaniah were in a tough situation. Yes, they had been promised a new Jerusalem, one where all would humbly serve the Lord, where their sins would be forgiven. But still, the ten tribes were in exile. Judah as a whole was not faithfully serving the Lord. And the Lord has just declared that Judah would also be wiped out. God's people and the Lord Himself was being dishonored. This was a time of mourning for the faithful. How do you rejoice in such circumstances? And yet the Lord comes to the command to sing aloud, to shout, to rejoice and exult with all their heart. But how can God's people do so at such a time? This morning we hear God's word to us through Zephaniah with the theme, Sing aloud and rejoice, for the Lord will save us on the day of the Lord. We'll look at two points. First, the Lord delights in us. And secondly, the Lord will glorify us. Sing aloud and rejoice, for the Lord will save us on the day of the Lord. The Lord delights in us. 
Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. What an exuberant declaration from the Lord. Don't those words warm our hearts? The Lord is again referring to his people as the daughter of Zion. Jerusalem is again recognized as a city where God has chosen to live among his people. The Lord again refers to his people as Israel, recognizing not only Judah, but also the ten tribes as his covenant children. The Lord again refers to his people as the daughter of Jerusalem. The city of the Davidic kingship is again recognized by her Lord. What an improvement from what we heard earlier in this prophecy when Jerusalem was called her who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. Instead of bitter cries of distress and wailing, the Lord calls His people to rejoice, to rejoice outwardly, to sing aloud, and to shout, to rejoice inwardly, to rejoice and exult with all their heart. The Lord calls His people to an exuberant display of joy that stems from the depths of the heart. But what a time to do so. Not only do God's faithful remnant have to live surrounded by fellow Jews who are hypocrites at best and outright idolaters at worst. The Lord has just declared disaster against His people. The Lord has declared that He would sweep the land clean just as he had done with the ten tribes 60 years earlier. Armies would invade the land. They could expect to suffer all the horrors of war, destruction of property, hunger and homelessness, death of loved ones either by starvation during the sieges or by the sword. The elderly slaughtered without respect Babies dashed against the walls. This is the reality that they have to look forward to. And how the Lord calls them to rejoice. How can He do so? The Lord provides the reason. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. The faithful remnant can rejoice because they will never again have to face the judgment of the Lord. The righteous Lord who dwells in Jerusalem, who never does injustice, has Himself removed every judgment against them. They are declared innocent by the righteous judge himself. And because of this, all their enemies will be removed. While the Lord had once sent enemies against them in judgment of their sins, now He has cleared away all their enemies. There is no enmity between the Lord and His people. He is not in their midst for wrath, but with salvation. And not only will He be in their midst as the righteous judge who will remove every judgment against them, he will also be in their midst as the king of Israel. Instead of a weak, fallible, human king, the Lord himself will be their king. What a situation to be in. With all their judgments taken away, they will never again have to worry about the Lord sending enemies against them. No more war. Peace forevermore. And with the Lord as their king, they would never have to worry about things going bad for the country. There would never again be a king who would turn the people away from God. They would never again have to fear evil. But you might say, hold on a second. Jerusalem will still be destroyed. The enemies have not been cleared away. And the Lord also acknowledges this. Although He says that He has taken away every judgment, 
and has cleared away all their enemies. He speaks in this way in order to emphasize the certainty of what He will do. It is so certain that the Lord will remove their judgments and will clear away their enemies. He speaks of this as if it had already been done. The Lord is really speaking of a future reality. And we can see this in His next words. On that day, while God's people will already benefit from this saving reality already, the Lord here is again referring to a specific day in the future when all this will be worked out in full. The day of the Lord. On that day, Jerusalem will be known by all as the most favored among cities. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will exult over you with loud singing. All will know that the Lord delights in Zion. Jerusalem will be known as Zion, the city of the Lord. While God's enemies will melt with fear, there will be no need for the faithful to let their hands grow weak with fear. All will know that the Lord who dwells in the in there is the mighty Lord who will save His people. While the mighty warriors of Jerusalem mentioned in Zephaniah 1 will cry out bitterly on the day of the Lord's wrath, unable to save Jerusalem from its enemies, the Lord, the mighty warrior, will save the faithful. And the faithful can be assured that the Lord will save them for He rejoices over them with gladness. While God's enemies must tremble in fear of Him, His children can have peace because of the Lord's love for them. A love as deep as a love of a groom for his bride. A love that describes a friendship as deep as David and Jonathan's. A love greater than that of woman. The same love that caused the Lord to deliver His people out of Egypt. The Lord does not want His beloved to be fearful in the face of the day of the Lord. He delights in her far too much to allow that. So in reaction to her fears, He will quiet her with her love. More than that, He will exult over her with loud singing, openly declaring His love for all to hear. Just as a groom's joy in his bride might burst out in song for all to hear, the Lord's love for His faithful will not be secret. And because the Lord in His great love will exult over her with loud singing, the daughter of Zion can also sing with joy the joy that comes from the depths of her hearts. Who would not rejoice at being the recipient of such a great love? It is a wonderful thing to experience the deep love between husband and wife, to experience the love of the best of friendships. And this love is still marred by sin. But God's love is perfect. Imagine being loved so dearly by the great Lord and Creator of all things, the One who controls all things. What evil, what horrible thing to cause us to fear in the face of that such love? Nothing. Well, brothers and sisters, don't imagine. This is our reality. We are loved by God so much. When we think about weddings, we had one here on Friday. 
We know the love between the bride and the groom. It's a beautiful thing to see. One that only matures over time. And that is a picture of God's love towards us. And that love is perfect. We do not have to fear the Lord's laugh, love, wrath. We are loved by Him so dearly. At the same time, the great love of the Lord doesn't mean that terrible times won't come. That His, par- that his people won't face times that will make anyone tremble in fear. The faithful in Judah would still have to endure the destruction of Jerusalem and the exile. The day of the Lord's wrath will come. However, our fears can be quieted by our Lord's great love for us. Even in the worst of situations, when the wicked tremble in fear, our Lord is still actively caring for us. If you turn to Ezekiel 9, you can see a wonderful example of this. Ezekiel was a prophet in the exile, so he was from from Jerusalem, from Judah. He was one of the first exiles. And in exile, he received a vision about the destruction of Jerusalem. We'll read the first part of that. So Ezekiel chapter 9. And as we read of this, take note of what God says about those who love him. Ezekiel 9. And he cried in my ears with a loud voice, saying, Bring near the executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his weapon for slaughter in his hand. And with them was a man clothed in linen, with a writing case at his waist. And they went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the Lord, of God of Israel, had gone up from the cherub on which it rested to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing case in his waist. And the Lord said to him, Pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. And to the others he said in my hearing, Pass through the city after him and strike Your eyes shall not spare, and you shall show no pity. Kill old men outright, young men and maidens, little children and women. But touch no one on whom is the mark. But touch no one on whom is the mark. Even in the chaos of war, the Lord is in full control. He is the king and mighty warrior who is able to control the battle so precisely that he is able to save every single one of his children from harm. Now, this does not mean that the Lord will protect us from all harm in this life. However, it does mean that no matter what turmoil we go through, That even if we die in horrible circumstances, every single one of us are under the protection and care of the mighty Lord. We are still in His loving hands. Our Lord delights in us and He will care for us. Brothers and sisters, This message that the Lord delights in us so much that He will save us is a wonderful comfort in this life of sorrow. Just as it could give much comfort to the faithful in the years leading up to the exile, it also provides us with much comfort. And we have all the more reason to rejoice in times of sorrow. We live 2,000 years after God's own Son took on human flesh from the kingly line of David to dwell in our midst. Jesus is that King and Bridegroom who so dearly loves His bride. The church 
so lo dearly loves us that he was willing to bear God's wrath on our behalf. Through this, he took our judgments away. There is not a single guilty judgment on our account. We are innocent in God's eyes. Our relationship with God is whole. And He would never send enemies our way in order to punish us, to wipe us out. We have no need to fear God's wrath. Jesus, in His great love for us, quiets us with His love. He told us, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Not long after that, he did lay down his life for us. And the Holy Spirit, who dwells in our midst, in our very hearts, witnesses of Jesus' great love for us, our Lord, who has saved us, who delights in us, is also in our midst. And He is in our midst for salvation and not for destruction. If we don't feel this love, or at times the experience of the joy seems to sputter like a dying candle, then we need to turn to the Lord. Meditate on His great love for us all that He has done for us. The love that caused Him to send His own dear Son to bear the terrible wrath, His terrible wrath on our behalf. In John 3, we read, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Think about how great a love the Lord has for us that He was willing to put His own dear beloved Son through the agony of hell for us that He Himself would bear the, the punishment for our rebellion. And all because He so dearly delights in us that He wants to live in our midst. He is looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth when we will all live together. And having meditated on this great love towards us, let us pray thanking the Lord for His unimaginably great love towards us, for us who are sinners at heart and so unlovable by nature, and asking, begging our dear Lord to work this joy in us with His Holy Spirit. We are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, and He will quiet us with His love. He will remind us of His love. He will reassure us of His great love towards us. And that brings us to our second point. The Lord will glorify us. Having heard the Lord speak of His great delight in them, the faithful can rejoice. And yet at the same time, they still mourn. The faithful know that the Lord will be true to His covenant curses. They have heard the prophets warn Judah of coming destruction. While they can rejoice in their own salvation, they also mourn because of the disgrace, the reproach that God's people will face because of their rebellion. The Lord knows their shame and sorrow over sin and over the coming judgment. So the Lord who delights in them, in them turns to quiet them with His love. He now turns to speak to His faithful directly 
in the first person, face to face. The last words of this prophecy are personal words spoken to the humble faithful by the God who loves them dearly. Now before we go on, we need to deal with the issue of translation. Now verse 18 is a difficult verse to translate and to understand. And one of the issues is what is meant by the word translated festival in the ESV. The Hebrew word literally is appointed time. And it often is used to refer to the feast days that the Lord appointed for Israel. However, it's not only used for that. It's also used in Genesis 1 for the seasons that God appointed. And in Genesis 18, it's used for the time that was appointed for Sarah to have a son. The Hebrew word is used to refer to an appointed time or period. So the question becomes, what appointed time are the faithful mourning about? Is it the festivals or some other appointed time? Now the context of the prophecy favors some other appointed time. Firstly, the the festivals have not been spoken of in this prophecy, so it would be odd to suddenly bring them in at the end. But secondly, this prophecy is filled with references to another appointed time, the day of the Lord. The Lord here is speaking of those who are mourning over this destruction that will come over Jerusalem and Judah. That day will be a day of reproach for God's people. The exile of the ten tribes has already caused disgrace to God's people. And the exile of Judah will cause even further disgrace to God's people and thus also to God Himself. The nations will not see that the Lord is using foreign nations to punish His unfaithful people. All they will see is that the God of Israel and Judah is not as strong as the gods of the nations who conquered them. While God's people used to be feared because of the power of the Lord, now they will be taunted. While the Lord used to be feared because of His mighty feats that He had accomplished for His people. Think about the exile, the ten plagues, and the the crossing of the Red Sea, God caring for His people during the 40 years in the wilderness, the crossing of the Jordan River. God's people came to Canaan 40 years after the the, the, the return, the free, uh, after they came out of Egypt, and the Canaanites were afraid because of the Lord. They knew God was powerful. And God has shown throughout Israel's history that He was a powerful God. But now, the Lord will be seen as just another defeated God. Although the faithful know that the Lord is being faithful to His covenant, meeting out the covenant curses just as He promised, they also know that the nations won't understand it this way. And the glorious nation of Israel, the nation that once was the glorious world superpower in the days of David and Solomon, would be reduced to exiles scattered throughout other nations. The beautiful temple, which stood as a witness to the presence of the Almighty God of heaven and earth, would be gone. The feast days, days when men were appointed to come together to meet, to worship the Lord, to have fellowship together with the Lord, would no longer exist to give glory to God. They were were to be the nation which brought glory to God, a witness to the Lord to all the other nations, would cease to be a nation. What disgrace. What reproach. But the Lord says, I will gather those of you who mourn for the appointed time so that you will no longer suffer reproach. While they will be scattered among the nations, the Lord would bring them back together. They would again be the nation. The temple and Jerusalem would be rebuilt. 
they would no longer be disgraced. In addition to their being gathered together, their oppressors would be dealt with. Babylon would soon conquer Assyria. And when the appointed time of exile was over, the Medes and Persians would then conquer Babylon. And at that time, the Lord would gather His people, causing Cyrus to decree that they should return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. The oppressors would be gone and they would be back in the promised land. The Lord comforts him that he will save the lame and gather the outcast. This is language the Lord has already used in similar prophecy decades earlier through the prophet Micah. There he said, In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I have afflicted. And the lame I will make a remnant and those who were cast off a strong nation, and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. The lame are those whom the Lord has afflicted, badly hurt by the exile. The outcast are those whom the Lord has thrown out of the land. But their loving Lord would not abandon His covenant children. He will save them and gather them to Himself, changing their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. The Lord will glorify His people. And the Lord is not satisfied with just saying it once. The Lord who started off Zephaniah, the prophecy of Zephaniah, with a double declaration of total destruction now ends the prophecy by giving a double declaration of restoration. At that time I will bring you in, at that time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Just as He had underlined the destruction of the rebellious at the start of the prophecy, He now underlines the glorification of the humble. The covenant blessings are as certain as the covenant curses. The humble can be assured that they will be gathered in and glorified. The humble can be assured that they will, their fortunes will be restored before their very eyes. The Lord has said it. The salvation is as certain as the destruction of the wicked. At the same time, when the Lord speaks of at that time, we get the impression that He is not talk, talking only or even primarily about the exile of Judah and the restoration 70 years later. We get the impression that both the destruction and the restoration will happen at the same time. The language used also speaks of total annihilation and total glory for His people. Although God's people have experienced foretastes of this prophecy, they have never been without enemies. And they have never been renowned and praised to the full extent spoken of in this prophecy. Even today, two and a half thousand years later, we cannot point to a time when this prophecy has been fully fulfilled. An event is being referred to that has not yet happened. That event, of course, is the day of the Lord. The day when Jesus will come back on the clouds. At that time, He will gather all His people to Himself. The dead will be raised and meet Him on the clouds. Those who are still alive will be taken up and ascend with the Lord, ascend to the Lord on the clouds. And then once the Lord has saved His dear bride, He will then pour out judgment on all His and their enemies, wiping the earth clean. Only then when all the, will all the enemies be cleared away. Only then will every last remnant of shame be turned into praise and glory. The restoration on the day of the Lord 
was a hope that could cause the faithful in the days of Zephaniah to rejoice even as they mourned. Although they mourned over the disgrace of God's people, they also re could rejoice in the knowledge that their Lord loved them dearly and has guaranteed that a day would come when their enemies would be destroyed and when their shame would be turned into glory. The restoration on the day of the Lord is also the hope that can cause us to rejoice from the heart even as we mourn. While we are saddened when the people attack the church and saddened even more when the sin of the church causes that attack, we rejoice in the fact that we are loved by the Lord. We rejoice in the fact that Jesus delights in us so much that He was willing to bear our shame. God tells us in Hebrews, Jesus, who for the joy that was set before Him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Our dear Savior looks forward to the day when we, His bride, will live with Him in perfection on the new creation. The thought of it gives Him so much joy that He was willing to bear our shame. That agony, the suffering on the cross. He was willing to bear it because of the joy of looking forward to living with us, with us glorified on the new heavens and the new earth. Our Savior loves us so much. Because of this love, even though we have not yet attained complete freedom from our enemies, we can rejoice. Even as our enemies mocks and threatens, even as our enemies attack, we can still live a life of joy. Not just a facade of joy, a false front, but a real joy that comes from a heart that knows that this trouble is just a passing trouble and that when it passes, we will live in eternal glory in the presence of our dear Savior forever. What joy awaits us. The few years of grief in this life is like nothing in the face of the eternity of joy in the presence of our Lord. As Paul writes to the Romans, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Brothers and sisters, even in our darkest hour, we still have a bright future ahead of us. Our sins are forgiven. The Lord has cleared away every judgment of guilt. The Lord delights in us. He will never visit us in wrath but will instead calm our every fear. The Lord, who rejoices over us as much as a groom for a bride, lives in our midst. We have the Holy Spirit. He has told us that He delights in us so much that He will break out in loud singing because of us. In His love for us, He has prepared a wonderful future for us. He will remove our every last enemy. He will take away every shame and reproach. He will make us the most renowned and praised people of all the earth. The Lord has promised us a future of eternal peace and glory. Brothers and sisters, we unworthy sinners have been sown such great love by our Lord. The Lord in His great love has given us everything even though we do not deserve one iota of it. In the face of receiving such great love, can we not help but rejoice? Amen.